Hi and welcome to my lecture on multifetal pregnancy. This is Doc Ina. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaine. References for this lecture include the following, Williams of Cetrix 25th edition, ACO Committee Opinion, and UpToDate.com. And here's the outline for my lecture. So basically, we have two kinds of twinning, the dizygotic or fraternal twins, which result from fertilization of two separate ova, and the monozygotic or the identical twins, which arise from a single fertilized ovum that divides. Either or both processes may be involved in the formation of higher numbers. So the outcome of the monozygotic twinning process depends on when division occurs. So for a diamnionic dichorionic pregnancy, this happens when the zygote divides within the first 72 hours after fertilization, thereby resulting in two embryos, two amnions, and two chorions. For a diamnionic monochorionic pregnancy, this happens when the zygote divides uh, between the fourth and eighth day after fertilization. And for a monomionic monochorionic pregnancy, this happens when the division approximately uh, happens on the eighth day after fertilization. So that's when the chorion and the amnion have already differentiated, thereby resulting in two embryos within a common amnionic sac. So we have the term superfetation and superfecundation. For superfetation, this happens when an interval as long as or longer than a menstrual cycle intervenes between fertilizations. Superfetation requires ovulation and fertilization during the course of an established pregnancy, which is theoretically possible until uh, the uterine cavity is obliterated by fusion of the decidua capsularis to the decidua parietalis. Most authorities believe that alleged cases of human superfetation result from markedly unequal growth and development of twin fetuses with the same gestational age. Superfecundation, on the other hand, refers to fertilization of two ova within the same menstrual cycle, but not at the same coitus, nor necessarily by sperm from the same male. Given that superfecundation may also result with IVF ART, women should be advised to consider avoiding intercourse after embryo transfer. Factors that influence twinning include race, maternal age, parity, heredity, nutrition, infertility treatment, especially IVF treatment, and pituitary gonadotropins. For the sonographic determination of chorionicity, early in the first trimester, the number of chorions equates to the number of gestational sacs. A thick band of chorion separating two gestational sacs signals a dichorionic pregnancy, whereas a monochorionic twins have a single gestational sac. After 10 to 14 weeks AOG, sonographic assessment of chorionicity may be determined using four features, and they are the number of placental masses, the thickness of the membrane dividing the sacs, presence of an intervening membrane, and fetal gender. So firstly, two separate placentas suggest dichorionicity, and the converse is not necessarily true, such as uh, in cases with a single fused placental mass. Secondly, identification of a thick uh, dividing membrane, generally more than 2 mm, supports a presumed diagnosis of dichorionicity. In a dichorionic pregnancy, this visualized membrane is composed of a total of 4 layers, 2 amnion and 2 chorion. So just to illustrate, in a dichorionic pregnancy, you have a thick dividing membrane that's uh, more than 2 millimeters. So we have the twin peak sign or the lambda sign, which is a triangular projection of placental tissue between the layers of the dividing membrane. So for a monochorionic pregnancy, the dividing membrane is less than 2 millimeters thick and you have the T sign. Okay, so the T sign is the right angle relationship between the membranes and the placenta. So there's no extension of the placenta between the dividing membranes. We can diagnose multiple fetuses uh, in different ways. So first, of course, is through clinical evaluation. And the first would be through the uterine size. 
So, in a multiple uh, gestation, uterine size is typically larger during the second uh, trimester than is expected. Now, between the 20th and the 30th week EOG, the fundic height averages approximately 5 cm greater than what is expected. We can also palpate two fetal heads, often in different uterine quadrants, and of course, appreciate more than one fetal heartbeat. Of course, a confirmatory test would be sonography. And we see here, separate uh, gestational sacs can be identified early in twin pregnancy or two fetal heads or two abdomens can also be seen in the same image plane. We can also do radiography and MRI, although of course, uh, ultrasound would be the preferred method of confirming uh, multi-fetal gestation. However, abdominal radiography can be used if fetal number in a higher order multi-fetal gestation is uncertain. MRI provides a more detailed assessment of pathology in twins and is particularly very helpful in cases of conjoined twins. Can biochemical tests or there's, is there any biochemical test that identifies multiple fetuses? Of course, none. However, Serum and urine levels of beta-HCG and maternal serum alpha-fetoprotein are generally higher with twins compared with singletons. Okay, let's talk about maternal adaptation to multifetal pregnancy. So physiological burdens of pregnancy and the likelihood of serious maternal complications are of course greater than uh, with multiple fetuses than with singleton. So Usually, the patient experiences hyperemesis gravidarum, and of course, uh, our patient will have higher blood volume expansion in, or hypervolemia, which result in a more profound anemia. Cardiac output is increased another 20% above that in women with a single-term pregnancy, and vascular resistance is significantly lower in twin gestations throughout pregnancy compared with single-ton gestations. Uterine growth, uh, of course, is substantively greater than a single-ton pregnancy. And because of this, maternal abdominal organs and lungs can be compressed and displaced by the expanding uterus. Okay, how about pregnancy complications? Uh, first will be spontaneous abortion and miscarriage rates are higher with multiple fetuses compared to a singleton pregnancy. For a singleton pregnancy, the, the incidence of spontaneous abortion would be around 0.9%. And contrast that to the incidence rate of uh, spontaneous abortion in multiple pregnancies, which is very high at 7.3%. Monochorionic placentation was more, is more common in multiple gestations ending in, mis, uh, in miscarriage. Also, there's increased incidence of congenital malformations in multiple gestations. And malformation rate um, in monochorionic twins is twice that of dichorionic twin gestations. Third is low birth weight. Now, multifetal gestations are more likely to have low birth weight than singleton pregnancies due to restricted fetal growth and preterm delivery. And in general, the degree of growth restriction increases with fetal number. The degree of growth restriction in monozygotic twins is likely to be greater than that in dizygotic twins. Now, the fourth will be hypertension, especially if the pre-pregnancy BMI of the patient is more than 30 kg per meter squared. And the pathology involved here would be the increased fetal number and uh, the placental mass, or the increase in the placental mass. With multifetal gestation, hypertension not only develops more often, but also tends to develop earlier and be more severe. Next is preterm birth. And uh, prematurity or the incidence of prematurity is increased sixfold among twins and tenfold in triplets, respectively. And lastly, we have the long term infant development. But fortunately, no cognitive outcomes between. Uh, twins and singletons are similar. However, among normal birth weight infants, the cerebral palsy risk is higher among twins and higher order multiples. So at this point, we'll discuss about aberrant twinning mechanisms. So for monozygous twins, we have uh, basically we have two uh, classifications, the, sym the symmetrical type and the asymmetrical type. And then under symmetrical type, we have the separate uh, uh, kind of twinning 
and the conjoined twins. For asymmetrical type, we have the aquariac type, the parasitic type, and the fetus in fetus. And we'll discuss uh, these uh, classifications in the next few slides. Okay, so first let's talk about conjoined twins. So conjoined twins have been referred to in the past as Siamese twins. This is after the um, conjoined twins named Cheng, Chang and Eng Bonker of Siam. And for conjoined twins, the thoracophagus is the most common. Thoracophagus meaning they are joined in the thorax, such as this picture that you see here. In cases of conjoined twinning, a targeted examination including a careful evaluation of the connection and the organs involved is very, very important. Now we have, uh, basically we have two types of conjoined twins, those who are um, connected ventrally and those who are connected uh, dorsally. Okay, so when, when they are connected ventrally, they can be connected uh, rostrally, caudally, and laterally. Okay, so on ultrasound, uh, we note that the fetal poles are very closely associated no, and they do not change relative uh, position from one another. MRI, as I've already mentioned, play a very important adjunctive role, especially in clarifying shared organs between these conjoined twins. Surgical separation of an almost completely joined twin pair may be successful if essential organs are not shared. And consultation with a pediatric surgeon often assists parental decision making. Of course, no viable conjoined twins should be delivered by cesarean section. Next is the external parasitic twins. This happens when the grossly defective fetus or merely the fetal parts of a defective fetus uh, are attached externally to a relatively normal twin. So you can see in this picture, you now you have a normal twin here and attached dorsally are the uh, two lower extremities of uh, the parasitic or the defective uh, twin. A parasitic twin usually consists of externally attached supernumerary limbs. A functional heart or brain is absent in the defective or parasitic twin and parasitic uh, or parasites are believed to result from demise of the defective twin. Next, we have the fetus in fetu or the internal parasitic twin. Early in development, one embryo may be involved, enfolded within its twin and as a result, normal spatial arrangement of and the presence of many organs is lost. These masses are believed to represent a monozygotic, monochorionic, diamionic twin gestation and are typically supported by large parasitic vessels to the host. So next, we'll discuss about monochorionic twins and vascular anastomosis. First, we have the TTTS or the twin-twin transfusion syndrome. In this uh, condition, blood is transfused from a donor twin uh, to its recipient sibling such that the donor may eventually become anemic or pale as you can see in this picture and its growth may be restricted. The recipient twin on the other hand becomes polycythemic again as you can see that in this picture or plethoric and may uh, develop circulatory overload which manifests as high drops. Circulatory overload um, from heart failure and severe hypervolemia and hyperviscosity may develop. Polycythemia in the recipient twin may lead to severe hyperbilirubinemia and kernicterus. So this condition is usually detected in mid-pregnancy when the donor fetus becomes oliguric because of decreased renal perfusion and therefore uh, uh, this um, donor twin may have oligohydramnios, whereas the recipient uh, fetus or recipient twin develops severe polyhydramnios, presumably because of increased urine production. The low or absent amniotic fluid in the donor sac prevents fetal motion. That's why uh, most of the time this is called the stuck twin. In the condition TTTS, usually is called polyhydramnios oligohydramnios syndrome or polyoli. The amniotic fluid balance is associated with growth restriction, contractures, and pulmonary hypoplasia in the donor twin, and premature rupture of membranes and heart failure in the recipient twin. 
So this is a very nice picture depicting the TTTS. No? So we can see here the unbalanced or preferential uh, shunt or blood flow from the donor twin to the recipient twin. And therefore, this recipient twin may develop the following conditions. So polycythemia, hypertension, polyuria, polyhydramnios, circulatory overload, heart failure, hydrops fetalis, and fetal demise. Whereas the donor twin may experience the following. So anemia, hypotension, oliguria, oligohydramnios, circulatory insufficiency, growth restriction, renal failure, and eventually fetal demise. The Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine diagnoses TTTS based on two criteria. First is the presence of, an, uh, of a monochorionic diamnionic pregnancy. And of course, number two, the presence of hydramnios and oligohydramnios. So hydramnios in one twin and oligohydramnios in the other twin. And TTTS is typically staged by the Quintero staging system. So for stage one, the, uh, the amniotic fluid volume uh, is discordant, but the urine is still uh, visible sonographically within the bladder of the donor twin. For stage 2, you know, we have discordant amniotic fluid volumes. However, the urine is not any more visible within the donor bladder. Stage 3, uh, you have the criterion for stage uh, 2 plus abnormal Doppler studies of the umbilical artery, ductus venosus, or umbilical vein. Stage 4, uh, you already have, or the twins already have ascites or frank hydrops. And stage 5, demise of either fetus. Early diagnosis of cardiomyopathy in the recipient twin may identify pregnancies that would benefit from early intervention. And we have the MPI, that's the Myocardial Performance Index, or TE index, which is a Doppler index of ventricular function calculated for each ventricle. The prognosis for multifetal gestations complicated by TTTS is related to the Quintero stage and gestational age at presentation, and the outcomes in those identified at stage 3 or higher are much worse, and the perinatal loss for stage 3 or stage 4 is uh, about 70 to 100% without intervention. And nowadays, several therapies are currently used for TTTS. TTTS, and this include annual reduction, laser ablation of the vascular anastomosis, selective feticide, which of course is not being done here in the Philippines, and septostomy, which is the intentional creation of a communication in the divided amniotic membrane. Next, we have the twin anemia polycythemia sequence, or the TAPS. This is characterized by significant hemoglobin differences between the donor and the recipient twins without the discrepancies in amniotic fluid volumes that's typically seen in the TTTS. This is diagnosed antenatally by medial cerebral artery peak systolic vol velocity, more than uh, 1.5 multiples of the median in the donor, and less than 1.0 multiples of the median in the recipient twin. Next, we have the twin reversed arterial perfusion or the TRAP sequence, and this is also known as the cardiac twin. There is usually a normally formed donor twin that has features of heart failure in a recipient twin that lacks a heart or a cardiac and other structures. It has been hypothesized that the trap sequence is caused by a large artery-to-artery -artery placental shunt that is also often accompanied by a vein-to-vein -vein shunt. Within the single shared placenta, arterial perfusion pressure of the donor twin exceeds that in the recipient twin, who thus receive um, reverse blood flow of the oxygenated arterial blood from its co-twin. This used arterial blood reaches the recipient twin through its umbilical arteries and preferentially goes to its iliac vessels, so only the lower body is perfused and disrupted growth and development of the upper body thereby results. So the failure of the head growth is called acardius acephalus. A partially developed head with identifiable limbs is called acardius myelacephalus. And the failure of any recognizable structure to form is acardius amorphous. Because of this vascular connection, the normal donor twin must not only support its own circulation, but should also pump its blood through the underdeveloped acardiac recipient, which leads to cardiomegaly and high output failure in the normal twin. 
And so we also have complete hydatidiform mole with coexisting normal fetus. And this is also termed a twin molar pregnancy. This is due to a complete diploid molar pregnancy comprising one conceptus, whereas the co-twin is a normal fetus. So the graphically, a normal appearing twin is accompanied by its co-twin, which is a large placenta containing multiple small anechoic cysts. Optimal management is not known for this twin gestation. Pregnancy progression exposes the woman to persistent trophoblastic disease that requires chemotherapy and may be possibly fatal. Despite this, pregnancy continuation is recommended in cases with normal twin, no early preeclampsia, and declining HCG levels. If observation and pregnancy progression is chosen, preterm delivery is frequently required because of the persistent and heavy bleeding or severe preeclampsia. So now let's talk about discordant growth of twin fetuses. So twin discordancy is calculated using the larger twin as the index. So for example, we have twin A weighing 3,200 grams and twin B weighs about 200 uh, 2,500 grams. So to, co to compute for the percent weight discordancy, 3,200 grams minus 2,500 grams divided by 3,200 grams. So we have 21.87%. And this is considered significant. Okay, so we consider um, significant weight discordancy if the computed uh, weight discordancy is more than 20%. Another way of computing for twin discordancy is through the abdominal circumference. So if there's a difference in abdominal circumference of more than 20 millimeters between the uh, twin pairs, then uh, that is considered um, discordant twinning. An equal placental sharing is probably the most important determinant of discordant growth among monochorionic twins. However, among dichorionic twins, the reason may be is that dizygotic fetuses may have different genetic growth potential or one placenta might have a suboptimal implantation site. So how do we manage twin discordancy? Sonographic monitoring of growth within a twin pair and calculating discordancy is the mainstay in management. And monochorionic twins are generally monitored more frequently because their risk of death is higher. The RCOG advocates delivery by 37 weeks AOG among monochorionic twins with twin discordancy and 38 weeks AOG in dichorionic twins with uh, twin discordancy. If discordancy is identified in a monochorionic twin pregnancy, umbilical artery Doppler studies in a smaller fetus may help guide management. Investigators have correlated umbilical artery Doppler results with placental findings and with a degree of selective fetal growth restriction to predict fetal outcome. The correlations or discorrelations have yielded categories of selective fetal growth restriction. So you have the type 1 which is characterized by positive end diastolic flow, a smaller degree of weight discordance, and a relatively benign clinical course. Type 2 displays persistently absent end diastolic flow in the smaller twin and carries a higher risk of deterioration and demise. And type 3 is intermittently absent or reversed end diastolic flow. And because of large artery to artery anastomosis associated with the placentas in this category, type 3 is associated with a lower risk of deterioration than type 2. Now we talk about fetal demise. In some pregnancies, one fetus dies remote from term, but pregnancy continues with one or more live fetuses. So the term vanishing twin is used for uh, multi-fetal gestations where one fetus dies very early in pregnancy. Fetus compressus is a term we use for a dead fetus that is barely identifiable and is compressed, compressed appreciably. And fetus papyracious is a term we use for a dead fetus which may be flattened remarkably through desiccation. So how do we manage these cases where there is death of one fetus? Decision should be made based on gestational age, the cause of death, and the risk to the surviving fetus. Now, if the loss occurs early in the first trimester, a vanishing twin is considered harmless to the survivor. If the loss occurs after the first trimester, then the risk of death or damage to the survivor is largely limited to monochorionic twin gestations. 
Morbidity in the monochorionic twin survivor is almost always due to vascular anastomosis, which often causes the demise of one twin followed by sudden hypotension in the other. If one fetus of a monochorionic twin gestation dies after the first trimester but before viability, pregnancy termination can be considered. But of course, again not, pregnancy termination is not um, an option here in the Philippines. Single fetal death during the late second and early third trimester presents the greatest risk of the surviving monochorionic twin. Delivery generally occurs within three weeks of diagnosis of fetal demise, thus antenatal corticosteroids for survivor twins' long maturity should be considered. Dichorionic twins can probably be safely delivered at term. Monochorionic twin gestations are more difficult to manage and are often delivered between 34 and 37 weeks AOG. In cases of single fetal death at term, especially when the etiology is unclear, most opt for a delivery instead of expectant management. Now we go to prenatal care and antepartum management. So we'll talk about diet, fetal surveillance, and the test of fetal well-being. So the Institute of Medicine guidelines for twin pregnancy recommend a 37 to 54 pound weight gain for women with a normal BMI. And their daily recommended increased caloric intake for women with twins is 40 to 45 kcal per kilogram per day divided into 20% protein, 40% carbohydrate, and 40% fat divided into 3 meals and 3 snacks daily. The cornerstone of fetal assessment in twin pregnancy is identification of abnormal fetal growth or discordancy. Serial sonographic examinations are usually performed throughout the third trimester. Assessment of amniotic fluid volume is also very, very important. Associated oligohydramnios may indicate uteroplacental pathology and should prompt further evaluation of fetal well-being. Non-stress tests or biophysical profile are commonly used in the management of twin or higher order multifetal gestations. Now we discuss about the timing of delivery. ACOG recommendations regarding the timing of delivery of a multifetal gestation include the following. So for a dichorionic, diamionic pregnancy with no growth restriction, ACOG recommends delivery at 38 weeks AOG. For a monochorionic diamionic pregnancy, the recommendation is to deliver the uh, babies in, at 34 to 37 weeks AOG. For a monoamionic uh, pregnancy, the, the, uh, the, the recommendation is to deliver the babies at 32 to 34 weeks AOG. For a diamionic dichorionic uh, pregnancy with isolated fetal growth restriction, the, the recommendation is to deliver the babies at 36 to 37 weeks. For a dichorionic diamionic pregnancy with concurrent condition, abnormal Doppler studies, maternal comorbidity such as preeclampsia and chronic hypertension, the recommendation is to deliver the babies at 32 to 34 weeks. And for a monochorionic diamionic pregnancy with isolated fetal growth restriction, the recommendation is to deliver the babies at 32 to 34 weeks. So lastly, we talk about the delivery route. For a cephalic-cephalic uh, presentation, the delivery can usually be accomplished spontaneously or with forceps. So it means that we can deliver uh, the, the babies uh, vaginally. For a cephalic non cephalic uh, presentation, the optimal delivery route remains controversial. So your options would be to do cesarean delivery outright, or you can also do vaginal delivery of the cephalic first twin, then do external cephalic version of the second twin, if the fetal weight is more than 1,500 grams. A trial of labor in cephalic and cephalic presentation is not advisable when the gestational age is less than 28 weeks, or the estimated fetal weight of the second twin is less than 1,500 grams. Breach delivery is not advisable in the following settings because of concerns about head entrapment. Number one, if the estimated fetal weight of the second twin is more than 20% that of the presenting twin before labor. So for these cases, we offer the options of external uh, cephalic version or outright cesarean delivery for the second twin. If the second stage of labor of the 
First win suggests that the pelvis may not be adequate for a breech delivery such as when there is prolonged second stage or marked molding of the head. Then we can offer the option of external cephalic version or cesarean delivery of the second twin. How about breech presentation of the first twin? Problems with the first twin presenting as a breech are similar to those encountered with a singleton breech fetus. If we plan for a vaginal delivery of um, a multifetal gestation where the, the presenting twin is in a breech presentation, then major problems may develop if uh, the fetus is unusually large and the aftercoming head is larger than the birth canal. Also, if the fetal body is small compared to the fetal head, and uh, examples of this would be a preterm baby or a growth-restricted fetus or with a macrocephalic fetus due to hydrocephaly and if the umbilical cord prolapses. A unique potential complication of vaginal delivery of a breech presenting twin with a, a cephalic second twin is the possibility of interlocking shins, such as you see here in this picture. Therefore, this is one of the reasons why most obstetrician gynecologists would prefer an outright cesarean section if the first of twin uh, presents in a breech position. For monomionic twins, cesarean delivery is preferred. For triplet or higher order gestation, this is best delivered by cesarean. Vaginal delivery is only reserved for those circumstances in which survival is not expected. For example, fetuses that are markedly immature or maternal complications make cesarean delivery hazardous to the mother. Okay, so that's it for my lecture. And in summary, we've talked about the mechanisms of multifetal gestations, diagnosis of multiple fetuses, maternal adaptation to multifetal pregnancy, pregnancy complications, aberrant twinning mechanisms, vascular anastomosis, discordancy or twin discordancy, fetal demise, prenatal care and antipartum management, and lastly, we also discuss about delivery routes. Thank you for watching this lecture and please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel and my WordPress site, Dokina Obigaine. Thank you!